Welcome back to another episode of Log Talk with Pertinier Outdoors. This is your host, Billy, and this is going to be episode 69. Thank you all for sticking with us here, and the season is really starting to rock and roll. So this week's episode is going to be kind of a continuation of our Breeding Radio series, but a little bit longer form, uh, kind of a regular episode. So Jimbo uh, ran it this week, and he got on and did a podcast with John Teeter. Um, John shot a great buck out in central New York on his property uh, back, I believe it was the 24th of October. I think it was Saturday. Um, I'm sure we'll get into that. But uh, John shot his about a week and a half ago now or two weeks ago. And uh, Jimbo was able to shoot a beautiful buck up at our camp this past week. So we wanted to get his story out there too. So we've been following along with us on Instagram. You know that uh, this was uh, it was an awesome three, four days uh, to be in the deer woods just about everybody everywhere who's out there was getting into the getting into the action and uh, found some success, whether that was sticking one with an arrow or just being in, in the middle of the business. And uh, that is what we all live for is to get into the into the craziness of the rut or the pre-rut or any activity surrounding the rut. It is just the best. So um, this is uh, a great chat between these guys. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. If you're not following John, uh, Whitetail Landscapes, head over and check him out on Instagram and Facebook. Um, he does some consulting and will work with you uh, on your property to come up with game plans for managing your uh, your deer and your property and uh, kind of getting the most out of what you got if you're if you're looking to to do that. So John's done some good. Uh, he's done a couple podcasts with us and he's been on uh, some other other podcasts as well. He did one with. He's done a couple now with uh, Todd Waldron over in. Um, East to West hunting podcast and uh, really great conversations those two had as well. So definitely recommend you to check that out. So uh, hope you enjoy this discussion. We are, uh, we'll be putting out a bunch of episodes this week. I think uh, I've got at least two or three um, different breeding and radios that we will do. Uh, that will be uh, myself and my dad. We'll, uh, we'll do an episode. So we'll get that coming to you. Um, we got Nate Kennedy. He shot a nice buck. We got Nate, um, Wes, and Austin that were on here a week or so ago. Um, it looks like Austin shot, an, I think, pretty sure that was Austin that shot it, another giant Adirondack buck. So I can't wait to hear that story. And, um, God, I'm drawing a blank on the other. It's awful. I have my list upstairs. But, yeah, a lot of stuff hit the ground. Oh, Jim, geez, I'm so sorry. We got to do it for Jim. Jim D'Agostino out of PA, um, finally one of the PA boys, put something on the ground so we could get somebody on here to tell us what the hell's going on down there. So can't wait to hear all those stories this week. Um, hope you're enjoying the content that we keep pumping out. It's definitely, uh, it's been, it was a wild October, and uh, I suspect that November and December heading into Christmas will hopefully be the same with plenty to talk about. Um, Jimbo is, uh, can get after me as well. I've been, uh, slow getting the episode from their Adirondack muzzleloader weekend hunt. I got to get that out. So I'll probably drop that um, sometime throughout this week too, just to get that out there. It's a shorter 40 minute discussion, um, but a fun, fun podcast. Those guys did at camp. So good stuff there. And I know you've heard my spiel about uh, checking out the links in our bio. Uh, been a bunch of activity on those over the last couple of weeks. So I appreciate that. Uh, if you are looking to do any shopping um, buy any hunting gear, outdoor wear, clothes for your kids, your wife, Christmas gifts, anything of that nature. If you're doing that shopping online, uh, we have a few stores that uh, we have we have uh, affiliate codes set up with or affiliate links. So if you go to the the link that is in our bio, it's a website address, the link tree. If you click on that and you look at any of those stores that we have on there, um, if you're shopping at those stores, uh, any of your purchases will give us a little commission. And we greatly appreciate that as it uh, helps us fund what we're doing here and uh, everything that we've been able to do. It, uh, it, it all stems back to you guys and the listeners and uh, really enjoy seeing the numbers grow as hunting season passes along here too. So we got that and uh, we got some hats left. I would really like to get these gone. So I think everybody's been uh, spending more time in the woods and they have shopping, which I understand, but uh, I've got a few more of the orange hats left and I've got uh, probably about 10 of the calling them the mommy daddy hat maybe that's why they're not selling because it's a stupid name but uh, it's just a, a relaxed fit kind of casual hat 
It's my personal favorite and my wife's favorite, so that's why I bought them. I figured other people would like them. Apparently not, but uh, I think you should grab one. So head on over to pertinereoutdoors.com, check those out, and uh, help support the podcast. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you give us a rating and a follow on Instagram and Facebook. And after that, you've done your part. We'll just keep doing ours. So good luck to you guys the rest of the season. And uh, enjoy the content we've got coming down the pipe. See ya. Feed them. America. Hello. I, uh... Yeah, yeah. that's your yeah. name. Squirrels got me. Big Jim. Yeah. <laughs> Cold and fun. Cold and fun. That's good that you think of that of it because that's what deer hunting typically is, is cold and fun. Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday morning I'm glassing up on the pass and I see these deer moving. And I'm like, ooh, there's deer moving. All of a sudden I just see this person just head down, just hauling ass wearing shorts and a t-shirt with a pack on. And I'm like I'm like, is that tarred? My dad always talks about floating through the woods like the autumn breeze. So so Robert's when you're two hundred and seventy five pounds, I don't know how you do that, but the Freightliner. <laughs> <laughs> just like a creeper. He's kind of up in the corner watching what's going on there. Yeah. You know? He's like. <laughs> you know, he's up there slapping and pissing all over everything. Is it warm yet? <laughs> How did you know the name of the actor? That's right. I know. What did you say his name? Her- Herve Velichos. <laughs> <laughs> you know what Pertinier means? If you know what Pertinier means and you live in America, you're a redneck too. (laughs) Welcome to the Log Talk Podcast brought to you by Pertinier Outdoors. Alrighty, we are here with John Teeter from Whitetail Landscapes. Um, We both happened to get a nice buck down and we figured instead of doing it on the breeding them radio series we put out a little bit longer one and maybe talk a little bit about our properties and what we've done and uh how we ended up here you know halfway through archery season with nice bucks on the ground so i think we'll uh we'll kind of start with your story since you got yours first and uh we'll go from there yeah i've, I've had a pretty good season i've been i've been lucky right i i killed the buck on the 25th and uh you know this this may sound a little conceited but i was hoping to be done a little earlier than that I was um, too. <laughs> yeah. I I have uh I think probably like you I got family pressure right you got to get done you got to get done. Yeah, it's a new new thing for me this year because, you know, my baby's almost three months old and you know for me it's like, if I wasn't working I was in the woods so. Yeah. For, for me to have to try to find a balance, I was talking to Billy about it yesterday. I'm like, it is very weird, like having to figure out how to give it up because it's like, that's never been done before for us so. Yeah. Yeah. And so like October is my, is my kill month. You know, last, last year I killed the first day I hunted. Um, and, and, you know, the, the year before I hunted twice and I, I killed my deer. So my, my wife has become accustomed for the past four years, me <laughs> killing really early. And, you know, part of it is, you know, there's pressure on me a little bit, right? I'm running a business helping people design hunting properties. I better have some expertise and I know what I'm doing. And by the way, I'm, I'm no different from anybody else, right? I own 50 acres, right? I have access to a lot of properties. And the properties that I have access to, a lot of other guys hunt them. So I don't yeah. have exclusive on anything except my own land. And uh, so I am no different. In fact, I'm probably, uh, I, I'm guessing I'm worse off than you guys. You guys got a bigger chunk than me. So See, we're, we're super lucky because we only have 100 acres, but our neighbors are just super generous. And, you know, they, they own the top of the hill and the back of the hill that we're on. And they don't come up there much. It's almost like they just know that we kind of hunt it and they have another 700 acres that they hunt. So, and they're mostly until last year, they're mostly gun season. Um, But their kids kind of got into it last year and they were there like every single weekend, which was an adjustment for us. But at the same rate, it's like, that's awesome. It's great to see them up there. You know, we'll stay the hell out of the way and we got good stuff we can hunt that is theirs, but they don't really touch. So, I mean, it's just, we are we are definitely super lucky in that aspect but i know what you're saying about you know the properties you have permission on it seems like if you can get permission on a piece so can a lot of other people so yeah. that that makes it difficult yeah and you know and the other thing is you know i've got so many friends that want to come hunting with me 
my my partner that I do business with, he he's constantly begging me, you know, bring me, bring me, bring me. And, you know, I feel those type of pressures. And this year I wanted about me and my son. I wanted, you know, he's nine. I wanted to hunt with him a little bit this year. I, I have a neighbor down the street. He's 14. This is his first year hunting. We shot his first doe within two hours of going in the stand. I want to get him hooked. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's been a great year. I'm, I'm, I'm lucky, man. I, I got to experience a nice buck and uh, I can't wait to tell you my story, but at the same point, my neighbor shoot 14 years old shooting his first doe his dad i had to tell him to back the fuck off because we were focused on blood trailing and he kept jumping in front of me i mean i you can't make this stuff up man and right watching the kid learn, learn how to gut a deer i mean i love this stuff man i go yeah. you gotta eat the heart afterwards you know otherwise you know uh, <laughs> it's not a true kill and you, you know the spirit of the animal goes away you don't want that to happen right so yeah you know, i'll put a little you know, a, a little mystery around things for him. So it, right. it's a good season, man. You know, that's, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy. And, and frankly, if I didn't kill right now, I'd still be happy because I, I had some great things happen to me this season, you know, and, and sometimes it's the small wins that go, go a long ways. And the way I approach hunting season is maybe a little bit different than most, or I, I do look at a phases, you know, I don't do the jury, uh, right. jury segment that every week is a new phase, right? Yeah. The 13 you know, phases. Yeah, that's, you know, if anybody buys into those things, and I'm not saying their tactics aren't great. They don't, they don't look at a real explicit level. But you guys hunt in a zoo. Um, oh, yeah. And, 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 and you know, I, I'm going to say that honestly. And guys that listen to other celebrities, uh, other consultants, who you guys hunt in a zoo? I have consultant friends that are in Wisconsin that I'm very good friends with. And the differences are night and day. Oh, know? yeah. I mean, you're going to sit somewhere and see 50 to 75 deer a night. Yeah. That's I, I say, I say, you know, I, I got 130 class deer. I'm, I'm really excited. You know, my boss, yeah. 130 class, right. And, and he goes, he goes, John, we'd, we'd never shoot that in a million years, you know? Right. You know, and it's, it's fine. And it's, it's not about age class at times where I'm having a good time. And I think everyone kind of has to approach it that way. You know, look at your buck, man. Right. I mean, that is a stud. You killed a stud. So that was my goal this year was to kill something over two and a half because I mean, I got down killing two and a halves. I'll kill them all year long, but um, I've never been able to really step over into the three and a half. And I think it's just because I get so much excitement out of shooting a good two and a half. That I just don't care. Yeah, but right. there's, there's you know, wrong with that. for me this year, I was talking with Billy and you know, our buddy Adam that we hunt with and it's easy to get caught up in all the hype. But for me, it's really just, you know, when you're in the moment and it's the time is right and your fingers on that trigger and everything lines up and it's a good day. And then, you know, that's when I'm going to pull the trigger. But if it's not, if I'm not getting that feeling, I ain't going to pull the trigger. And, uh, you know, like you said, you were trying to kill early this year and you have the last few. Um, I got a farm set up down the road from the house and it's me and one other kid to hunt it. Um, and last year I killed on the first sit in my tree stand. Um, and it was kind of lining up to look like that this year with trail cam pictures. And I glassed the farm a couple of nights and I'm like, this is just freaking golden. Like they had it set up with red clover and uh, corn and beans out back. And the only woods there was the woods that I'm on. So I'm like, they got to come past me to go to the food. And I just thought it was set up on a tee for me. And I hunted it a couple of times early and I think I saw nothing the first time. And then the second time I had a good hunt, but they all came out of the corn to the east of me which I was hunting a west wind not expecting them to be already on the east side of me and they were so I actually had two little bucks in the woods fighting next to me and that the nice 10 point that came out of the um, corn he was he locked down on a v to that those two little bucks fighting and he was marching in and I needed like 40 yards and I had him and he walked right into the downwind and I'm like, son of a bitch. I'm like, this is not the way I had this going. So <laughs> I had that happen. And then I went to uh, some state land that is just up in the middle of nowhere. Nobody, I don't think anybody's going in there cause it's just hell. It's a cliff. And when you get to the top, there's oaks, but to get there is not fun. And I went in there scouting it and wanted to put a camera up. And I got up in there and I'm like, how have I not seen any deer? And I started thinking, I'm like, I bet you they go on the top of the hill at night and come down to this side hill during the day. So I'm like over the first crest and I'm just on a little bench and I'm looking at deer trails. I hear a branch break and I look up and there's just a line of 
three bucks just walking straight at me. And I'm like, holy shit. And the one about walked over me and he was a two and a half, but he was wide. And for some reason, the wide ones get me. And I had an arrow knocked and he was quartering two at like 10 yards and I couldn't get drawn back, but he like walked on the backside of the tree with me and I could see the next one coming was decent too. So I waited for him to get behind me and he ended up getting down when like five yards on the other side of the tree. And he ran up to the crest down behind the other one on the south side of the other one. So the other one was at like 10 yards, but yeah. he turned and looked back at the other one. Like, what are you doing? So I'm like, I wonder if I can get drawn back. So I drew back and to set the pin right on his shoulder at 10 yards. And I'm like, this would be so cool. But I was like, it's just that, you know, it's a small two and a half. I don't know. I'm trying to get away from that. So, you know, yeah. as cool as it would have been and as awesome of a hunt as it would have been, I'm like, it's early. I got to hold off here. I'm assuming it would have been a downhill drag, which would have been too. Bad. Oh yeah. It was from the top <laughs> to the bottom. He'd have been rolling down the hill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who knows? Maybe you know he's done in pieces, and they, they gutted. He gutted himself. Who knows? Yeah, right. <laughs> no. So I mean, oh. like you said earlier, like you make the hunts count, and it's the little wins, even when you don't kill. I mean, I was like completely yeah. satisfied after that hunt. I was like, the pin was on him. He was dead. You know, I could have had my deer, but I, you know, over the years, my my thing has been, uh, and people think I'm crazy, um, maybe to some degree. Um, you know, I got limited time, right? So that, that's a big factor in my decision-making. I am beyond tactical. Uh, I think at this point, um, I'm insane. Uh, you know, I expect every time I step in the woods, I'm killing the deer I'm going after. Um, and, and, I, and I would say, well, you know, that may be, not be possible because of all these things. And I'm going to tell you right now, I've done it year after year after year after year. It's been multiple years. And I think really what's happened is I am hunting areas with other guys, right? So I'm gauging what they've got going on. I'm judging what the deer are doing. Um, I'm looking at every facet of the hunt from, you know, the weather being somewhat complex at times and, and kind of gauging that, you know, relative food sources uh, during the period of time, hunting pressure, socialization aspect of the deer. I mean, the stuff that I'm looking at is like, really finite level so you're you're everything is a probability shift how can i put you know the most money in my pocket or how how can, how can i make the best bet on this thing and and that has been my trick the other thing i've said is i don't post scout i go in and i kill so on properties that i pre-plan and design i better know where the deer are going to be and if i don't and that's okay there's properties that i hunt that it's like that i like that because i'm, I'm guessing i'm looking deeper in the sign I know where I'm going to kill. I know when I'm going to kill. And it's, it's, it sounds very predictive, but it's, that's how I operate. You know, and I know it's, it, it, if you're going in, you're scouting your disease and you might have to do this on a new piece or a piece you're not familiar with. But if you have a piece that you own and it's not pre-set up and designed for that, you're going and making a drastic mistake. And I've got pieces where I can do zero manipulation on, but I know where the deer are going to be and I know how to hunt them. In there. And so you got to kind of have those planned out. And, Lately, I've been doing things way more aggressive than I've ever done before. Because again, the time factor. I'm going in day one to kill that deer, period. Um, and, you know, I usually hunt one stand and I'm done. And I've got, you know, like an example of 50 acres. I probably have, I used to do all hanging hunts. I want surprise attacks. I'm a little more, um, I'm a little more planned out. So even in sanctuary areas, I'll have stats, st uh, you know, tree stands already set that I'm, I haven't even hunted or I may not even plan on me, but in case I got to go in, it's, it's operation, you know, you know, kill Gumby or operation, who are, yeah. whatever it is, right. It's diving in like SWAT operations, right. And that, it sounds crazy, but it's all that pre-planning. The big guys that do this guys do it professionally. The guys that, um, you know, have a lot of money and time that they can do this. If you're not doing that type of stuff, it just, it, I don't want to say it gauges your seriousness, but it really says, how tactful can I be? Right. And I'm like, I am operation kill at that, at that moment in time. And I, I think the success speaks for itself. I hunt in central New York. I hunt in Syracuse, New York. Anybody can come to Syracuse, New York. The deer population here is laughable. Um, it is absolutely laughable. Uh, it's not compared to anything that I've experienced in Western New York or other places. Uh, it's laughable. Come on up. And I guarantee uh, people listening to this at this point may may agree with that and and i've been here my whole life and uh i, I gotta tell you i mean I, I i've learned a lot i've struggled i've learned a lot i've hunted suburban areas 
I've hunted business parks. I've hunted everything you can think of, but I've hunted a lot of Western York. I've hunted a lot of big timber. I've hunted everything. And I'm telling you, Syracuse is tough. Come to Syracuse because you know what? I think it's like, it's like hunting the Adirondacks, but there's, there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of guys around me. Guys are surrounding my property now. That's another change. So Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, these properties that you're really doing this on, on a daily basis or a yearly basis, I mean, is this more like ag land or more, you know, suburban property or hill country or just for the people listening, you know, the kind of setups you're doing? It's everything. I mean, suburban areas, I've done some suburban areas. Um, you know, a couple of suburban areas were, were less than 10 acres. I mean, so it shows how small that I can go. Um, I've done a huge farm that was over a thousand acres. Um, some of the smaller farms are, you know, or properties are usually 30 to 80 acres in that range. Um, and, you know, that's a little bit of my sweet spot because I, I spend like a full day there. Uh, if it's a bigger property over a hundred acres, you know, this, I, I like to spend two days on those properties because I literally walk every single inch of those properties. I mark GPS, mark everything. I, I, I literally need, I, I basically it's a massive data dump. And it's the same thing during hunting season. Like if I didn't, I didn't score, like I, I totally forget about it. I move on. It's like everything is a data dump for me. So the way I operate is, you know, I'll do a property plan, for example, I'll, I'll ingest all the data, take a lot of notes, I go back and plan. And then I, then I operate, I put the, put the plan together and then I'm on the next one. These, it, it's got to be almost real time for me because there's so much data and so much consideration and factors that go into it. And a lot of it's, a lot of it is still touch and feel kind of thing. I don't, I don't necessarily, um, I take the input from the, from the client uh, and I, I value that, but then, you know, I've hunted so many hillsides and big timber and know how to break them up. And, you know, I want them to be tactful and strategic. So I'm going to give them every option to be that way. And a lot of my clients have done a ton of work already. So it's, it's fixing some of the things that they've done. So now I look like the, I don't want to be the, the <laughs> asshole of the discussion, yeah. but we definitely have to dig into some changes. And, and so you learn, you just learn how to operate better with people. And I think if they yeah. hire you, they're willing to listen. And if they're willing to listen, they're willing to change. And I can tell you right now, it's not ironic. I'll give you an example. This year on my 50 acres, okay? Um, this is, I missed a bigger buck. I missed a bigger buck. Uh, <laughs> shot over his back. I haven't had time to practice a lot this season. Uh, I shot over his back, and uh, it happens. And guess what? I saw a bigger buck than the buck I killed. That's on 50 acres. I have right now, today, and I, I better be careful because my neighbors are starting to get angry with me because people are starting to understand some of the things <laughs> I'm doing. More than several shooters, and there's a buck right now in – much bigger than I killed 130 class buck. This buck is bigger than that. And by the way, there's two more that are bigger too. It's like, <laughs> I, I, I never had a situation like this until I bought my own land. And not that I didn't expect it to happen. I mean, I would expect that's so why I did it. But at the same point, you know, I never had these many options. I'm used to one deer in my, in my career. I, I, I hunted one deer over two years, three hunts. I put only three hunts in him. I killed, I saw him every time, all three times. I killed him. The year later, first time I went after. And so three hunts, one deer, to kill one deer. And that was my goal. And this year I set a goal, but the problem is there were so many good bucks running around. I, I, yeah. I said, okay, I, <laughs> I mean, how do you pass a 130 inch deer? I know. I don't think you do that. I mean. No, not around no, so here. So anyhow, it's just, it's just, it's amazing how when you have options, like I was overwhelmed. It's, you know, it's like when you have money, you don't worry about it. Um, it, it, you know, I was worried about every little thing that was going on with these deer over these years. Now I'm like, I have so many options. Uh, it's just a matter of when, when do I want to kill? I, right. I, and I make it sound super easy because it's not, but honestly, if you get into the system and you do what I'm doing, it's, 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 it's like clockwork. Yeah. So, not always, but a lot of times it is. So. I think a lot of like on our property, we're down in the hill country. And like you say, with your population around central Syracuse there, like, there's not a great population down there. I mean, you can go a weekend and see four deer. I mean, it's nothing. We're not sitting there watching just a line of deer coming down the hill at night and picking which ones we want to shoot. It's, you know, you get them on trail cam in the dark. You don't know how far they came from to get there. And, you know, you're just not, we know deer bet on our side hill, but you also catch them. You know, I got a Facebook request from a kid that's down the road from us the other day. And, uh, he asked me, he was like, you guys don't happen to have 150, 160 inch drop time buck on camera, do you? 
And I was like, you're talking about Frankenbeans, aren't you? <laughs> so yeah, I got to shooting the shit with him and we knew he doesn't live on our property. Um, but we were trying to figure out where he lived and the kid was like, yeah, he's, he springs and summers across the street from my house. We found his shed last year and he sent me a picture of it. And, uh, I told him, I go, he shows up between like the 14th and the 20th on a yearly basis. We've had him the last three years, same spot, like clockwork showing up. And, uh, I go, he actually hung on our property last year until, uh, the opening day of gun and my buddy shot at him and missed him. We never saw him again. And he goes, that's funny. My neighbor shot at him off the front porch twice and missed him too. <laughs> so this, so I'm asking him, I'm like, dude, how many people know about this deer? He goes, the whole fucking town. Yeah. He, was, he was like, they're spotlighting these fields every night. He's like, I'll be surprised if this thing doesn't get poached. I'm like, God damn, I hope that doesn't happen. Because I don't give a shit who gets it, but that that's an impressive deer. And I want the story when somebody shoots it. Yeah, I would too. I would too. But like that Boom. buck that I shot, we know that Frank showed up but we had this other buck on camera and I'm like, at first when we started getting cell cam pictures of him hitting the scrapes, I'm like, man, that's a doofy deer. I'm like, he's, you know, he's got a lot of shit going on, but I didn't think he was that old. And then we got a picture on our cutting link system um, last week, I think Monday or Tuesday. And he was standing during the daylight, ran a logging road, looking right at the camera and you could see the mass. And I'm like, holy shit, that's actually a really big deer. <laughs> I'm like, that deer's actually got some age on him. So when I seen him marching through the woods, that's all it, it took for me. I'm like, I could hold off and I probably will. Now, now that I filled my tag, I probably will have Frank and beans walk underneath me again. Like I did last year, but yeah, I can't pass up that old of a deer for no waiting no, for did. Frank that yeah, he might not did. show up again. And it's funny, you know, I was talking to a guy last night. Um, he's down in South Carolina uh, and it, yeah, I think he was the deer manager of the year award quality year management friend of mine a great guy. And we're just talking about, we're aging deer. We were, he sent me the jaws of the buck that he, I mean, some of these folks are getting so serious on these older age class deer. And I think a lot of it's just the trickulation of, of what's happening out in the Midwest. And, uh, you know, we can achieve, you know, some similar, we have much harder winters, um, much severe season. The seasons, severity of the seasons are so drastic here. Uh, the winter last, you know, actually, you know, the Sinesis period is, is anywhere between four to five months of uh, basically, the, the deer is starving. Uh, the, the buck that I killed this year, he had a lot of uh, this visceral fat on his, on his intestines, right? A lot, of, a lot of fat in his belly. You go out south and parts of the Midwest, and Midwest, they, they do as well, but some of these other areas don't have the same type of stress we have. And, you know, we had such a light winter last year. Yeah. Um, the buck that I killed, I'm almost certain he's a buck that I saw last year. And uh, I, I, I'm not kidding you. I mean, he put on. Uh, he put on 25, 20 inches. He was probably 100 inch year last year. 20. Well, yeah. he probably put on 30 inches. So 30 inches of growth in, in a year. That's in our area. That's unheard of. And these yeah. lighter winters, look, I like them. I mean, uh, <laughs> I personally like them, but I mean, I, I think for the deer, I think it's it's helping us out a little bit. You know, I hate them for snowmobiling, but <laughs> yeah. for the wildlife, it's funny for me because I'm huge into snowmobiling and. Um, I hate to see a bad winter, but I've also seen what the really good winters do to the, the animals. And, you know, my in-laws live right on that Tug Hill plateau line over to oh, Old Forge. Okay. Yep. And uh, they used to have just the most incredible turkey hunting there. And we had a winter like, I think it had to have been six years ago now, five, six years ago, where it was in like between zero and 15 for like three weeks. And they were just getting dumped on with lake effect and there was no base. And we were talking to loggers and they said that they were just finding flocks of turkeys dead around trees because they couldn't get down and get around. Wow. There was no base. There was like four foot of powder. They couldn't touch the ground or, or walk on a surface of anything. You know, last year was the winter where once you got up into that Tug Hill area, there was a lot of snow, but um, it was hot, cold, hot, cold. So it all layered up so they could get down and walk around and go get food and browse and shit like that. But yeah. that that one year they didn't have that. And I'm telling you, the turkey hunting still ain't the same up there. Um, yeah, no, you, it's you start, like starting that. to get back, but it it was the the winter on the animals, especially in the north country, is hell. So as much as I love the snowmobile, I hate to see it because I know what it's gonna do to the animals in the hunting. Yeah. Well, well, maybe I'll, let me dig into my story. I'll tell you a little yeah, bit about. Yeah, let's get right into yours. Kill. So, 
so this is this is interesting. So it's been it's been a good season. So I, I kind of look at the season in a bunch of phases, and not the dairy phases, my own phases. The feed the, the feed period or the initial period is kind of that summer transition into early fall. The deer are pretty predictable in that sense. You got to be really strategic, have a really good strike plan. You got to know a lot. The deer start to kind of, I guess, get out of their their uh, quote unquote summer patterns. A lot of the you see a lot of deer in the bean fields. Um, we don't have a lot of bean fields around us, but you know, kind of the green areas, of up areas. That's kind of what we have in our local area. And a lot of bedding in those areas, um, there's cover associated with them. They start to transition back into that timber, right? And they start to get, get deeper in the timber. Their social structures are pretty much set. Bachelor groups start to break up. Uh, they start to find kind of their, their home territories, right? And it's just this big transition phase. Um, those can be really good for picking up deer and those could be really good for killing deer. Um, and, and so I try to kill it as early as I can in kind of those, you know, summer habit, um, habits or, you know, I don't want to say patterns, because again, I, a deer aren't patternable in my opinion. Um, th their habits kind of promote what they do. So then we get into the next phase, and I call the next phase is, is the, the uh, front phase. So basically from, I'll say October 8th to right around the 24th, 25th in that area, I'm usually just focused on weather fronts, weather front yeah. changes. Keep it real simple. Um, For sure. There's other little factors you got to start to weigh in the deer's personalities and and all the things that go into your decision making. And, and I'm not just looking at factors, I'm looking at social behavior, a lot of different things. So this season was a good season. I usually don't hunt more than four or five times up to about the 25th. I'm generally hunting afternoons, I'm not hunting mornings. Um, I will go in after morning after deer if I'm gonna be super aggressive. And I will hunt a deer in a bedding area, not in a bed, in a bedding area. I will go after a deer. So the point I'm trying to make is, I'll be very aggressive if the intel tells me to be aggressive or I'll back down, depending on the deer's personality. Uh, and also it depends how many deer I have to go after, right? Uh, used to go after one deer. So now having multiple deer to go after, it's kind of been a little bit of a, a change in my mind. So I hunted six times uh, up into the time I killed this deer. Uh, he was the sixth hunt, okay? And this is over three properties. So I'm not just hunting my own property. How many other areas, other guys are hunting these other areas as well. Um, in that, I'm just gonna give you some statistics. And then we'll talk about my kill because uh, I'm a data guy. Uh, <laughs> I saw 12 bucks over six hunts. So average, right? Two bucks a hunt. Great. Out of those 12 bucks, I saw four shooters. That means deer to the three and a half or older, right? So that's good odds. And that's about right. If you start to think about the pyramid, uh, you know, deer, as they get older in age class, there's, there's less of them. So that, that's, that's about right. Actually, it's a little bit higher than I would think. So those are like really good statistics. So I'm like, great, I'm on my game. Now, how many chances did I have to shoot uh, any of those shooter bucks? One, because I missed. And I told you about that <laughs> earlier, okay? Yeah. Right over the years back, 36 yards. So if anybody on this podcast thinks that anybody's elite and great and all that kind of stuff, guess what? You can miss any time. Nobody's perfect. And, and I'm, 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 I'm raising my hand. I screwed up, okay? Yeah. So there's the first thing. Uh, the second time, uh, the buck that I killed got his ass kicked by a bigger buck. And it was an incredible hunt, four bucks that day. So add that to my 12, um, four bucks that day. And two bucks went on an unbelievably heavy. These bucks are fighting like you would think they're fighting right now. By the way, this is a fight phase right now. Um, so these bucks, snort wheezing. I mean, if you've never heard of snort wheezing, well, a lot of guys haven't. Um, you know, and I very rarely hear it, but man, it, it's, it, it, gets your, it gets you going, oh, yeah. man. Yeah, uh, it's, buck it's comes intense. in chasing. I mean, like rams hitting, boom, boom. And uh, the bigger buck, who I didn't kill, uh, kicked the shit out of the buck that I killed. And I can admit that. My buck was the less dominant. He's a satellite deer. 130-inch um, deer, guys, they don't, they don't have to be 130 inches to be dominant. They're not. Right. I've seen some pretty, pretty tough, you know, gnarly six-pointers and eight-pointers kick his ass. Um, yeah. The other deer actually would probably score better than the buck. That's a different issue. Um, whatever. So, uh, so good season, right? Up that point. So, uh, I usually don't bump in the mornings. I, I've had some issues with deer hunting in the mornings, but but I generally will. So, I, I do a morning transition right around the 24th, 25th. But it it's all data driven. Uh, the week before that, in the October lull, which by the way is a fallacy, is the most bullshit. If anybody wants, we'll do a podcast on that sometime. Um, <laughs> I saw most of my deer during the October lull period. Okay, which. I'll just say is anywhere between October 9th and the 22nd. Okay. I'm just making updates, but uh, I saw most of my bucks in that period. Okay. So 
let's let's throw that out as bullshit, okay, for another podcast. Right. So we'll talk about my kill. So my wife gives me permission to go hunting, right? I go out. <laughs> I love the bunny ears. <laughs> <laughs> I go out my land. I am going to kill one of two bucks, okay? Killed one of two bucks. I was I was targeting one of these two bucks, and uh, you know a lot of my buddies are like they go just what day you hunt, what day you hunt. It's all circumstantial. It's based on your circum circumstance, the weather in your area, the type of uh, deer dynamics that are going on. So this is my situation, post uh, post weather front, but two days after the weather front. So it doesn't it doesn't have the greatest draw, but that morning it was supposed to be high high humidity, and um, uh, then rising pressure. And uh, so you're getting a lot of thermal change at that point, okay? Um, but in the area I'm going, I'm not gonna jump right into a bedding area at that point, right? I'm staying, I'm still in transition areas. I'm not hunting, based on this circumstance, I'm hunting transition areas. So I'm not getting right on the deer. So um, about nine, there's no, well, actually, I get into the stand. I, I wanna tell about a folly here. I get into the stand, I'm doing, I'm hunting out of the saddle, right? So I put my sticks up, I'm, I'm all set up. I don't know why I did this, but I left my jacket in my bag. So there's like 50 pounds of gear down there that I got to haul up, right? <laughs> Somehow my bow gets unclipped, drops, hits the oh, ground, Jesus. okay? So my bow just dropped the ground. I was like, okay, we're going to pretend that never happened. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, that never happened. I'm a professional here, right? I, I need to like, and I'm admitting this everybody because this happens to everybody. My bow hits the ground. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. All right, climb back down, get on my saddle, get back down, blah, grab the bow, bring it back up. I'm like, it's... I got marks. I'm like checking my marks. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to pretend that never happened. <laughs> this is bad, right? I'm, I said, yeah. I'm in here to kill. I'm going to kill today. I'm going to kill today. If I got that on my mind, I'm screwed. So I, I, I raced it. Never happened. I'm sitting there, sitting <laughs> there. Um, about 945, okay, 950, the wind shifts. Now, I'm a big proponent of uh, wind-based bedding uh, with a thermal component. And sometimes it's a thermal component that drives the bedding. And and, and these properties, I really know where the bedding areas are. And I've got one to my left, one to my right, and a small transition area where there's a lot of, a lot of times it's kind of a satellite breeding area in front of me. But anyhow, I'm on the back side of that. Half an hour before anything starts to go down, my neighbor, okay, my neighbor's out walking his dog. He's got three dogs, okay? He comes past me, okay? I'm hiding in the tree because I don't want him to see because I don't want to have a conversation right now because right. I know he's going to talk to me. I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, I could broadside this neighbor right now. Shouldn't say that. But I'm thinking like, and by the way, these dogs have bells, bells on their on their oh, chains. God. I'm thinking to myself, okay, drop my bow, bells on the chains. I said, I'm gonna kill today. I'm still gonna kill. And I'm gonna kill, I'm gonna kill my my gut was like we were gonna kill anywhere between 10 and 11 because we're gonna have a wind shift. And in that wind shift, it picks up. It was a high pressure day. Things are starting to heat more rapidly. You're going to start to get a little wind change at that point. The bucks are going to shift. They're going to go from one bedding to the other bedding area. This is my bet, right? I'm betting on, these are all the factors I'm considering. There's other factors, but these are the, the primary factors I'm considering. Okay, so here's what happens. I'm sitting here and all of a sudden, I hear about 100 yards away, I get a ping. And uh, not a ping on my cell phone, I get a ping. It sounds like a, some ruckus is going on up there. I don't know what the hell's going on. So I let out a little maybe chasing, a little, a little bleep. And I'm like, okay, I, I don't like calling. I like to be a ghost. I don't call. Yeah, I don't do anything. me too. I don't put out scent. I want to be a ghost in the woods, okay? I was never there. No one ever saw me. I killed and I escaped. That's that's the plan. Um, there's one there's one issue, though, with my setup and entry and access is, is huge for all this stuff. Long story short, something's happening up there. I bleep. I give it a couple grunts, and I let it simmer. And... Um, and a little while later, I don't hear anything, don't hear anything. All of a sudden, here he comes, one of my bucks. Nice 10 pointer, the one I obviously, I was able to get. He comes in, all the ruckus that happened before me, dropped my bow, you know, the worst hunt that, that you know, dogs running around with bells on them. <laughs> Just hunt, you're here to hunt and you're gonna kill. The deer are used to that guy walking. He walks that all the I was, time. I was going to ask that. I was going to say, is that something he does on a regular basis? Yeah, and guess where I walk? Guess where I access? I access off where he where he walks. Yeah. So I'm using his access to my advantage, um, and his his his, pre his his presence to my advantage. So long yeah. story short, the deer comes in, comes in like 30, 31 yards in that range, and I just had the hardest time getting him to stop. I literally yell. I go, 
and then I go, hey, like that. Stop them. <laughs> right when I yell, hey, let it double long. When I hit the deer, he ran 30 yards and toppled over. And um, he only ran 40 yards probably after the shot, I would say total. Uh, double lunged him, and I could hear him hacking. And at that point, I'm pretty sure that I had double lunged him. And, uh, and uh, you know, I knew, I knew that I, I was in the money. So he dropped dead, and, you know, I try to be hush hush. I want to sneak out there like a, sneak out of there like a ninja. And uh, anyhow, it all worked out. Uh, was able to blood trail him, found the deer. That, but that's the story. There's a lot that went into that hunt. Um, he was not the dominant deer in that area, but a hell of a deer. And I was so happy and pleased. And, you know, yeah, I could have killed a bigger buck. And, yeah, I could have been more patient. I'm just happy like you. I'm just happy. Um, you know, it's been a good season. And that was kind of a good tell of tale of, you know, don't get bogged down with things that are going on around you. Um, you know, stay in your zone. Stick to a plan. Um, you know, have an objective, um, focus on what you're doing. No, no, really know what's around you. Have enough intel and, and, and start to collect that data to make some of these decisions. It's the sixth hunt, the 12th buck, uh, not how many does I saw. Those are 12 bucks. I saw four shooters. And I think that says a lot. And by the way, this is, this is on my land. Um, the other properties are near me on my own personal land. Most of the shooters were on my land. And so that shows a lot, says a lot about my land. Two and a half years ago, three years ago in November, when I bought that land, the biggest buck I had was a two and a half year old. So, so what, what did math. you, what did you really, you know, this year, as far as set up this year, um, what did you have going on for supplemental food or were you running trail cams, cell cams, so you didn't have to go in there? I mean, what was your whole setup leading into it? I kind of get a vision. It's some something that that's uh, you know doing enough property designs. You get a vision for what things are going to look like. And I went in and I kind of designed an area to kill a specific deer. I knew that um, my target deer. I'll just say my target deer. There's two target deer that I had, but I knew that one of those deer would frequent that area, and they did. Um, so I manipulated this area well enough to know where the deer are bedding, not bedding. If anybody does anything really simply, if you can help define where they bed it's a lot easier to hunt them. It's, it's really as simple as that. So helping to distinguish where, they, where they've been, and I'm hunting transition areas. So I'm not hunting right in the bedding. Um, and if I'm going into the bedding, I'm really, I'm desperate. Um, and I'm usually very conservative, and I also don't like that tack. There's guys like uh, DeQuisto, these big time guys, they'll bump deer in other areas, they'll hunt bedding. Um, you gotta be very aggressive, have a lot of options uh, to do stuff like that. I typically don't do that, I'll hunt them in transition. Um, and so the manipulation concept and collecting data, I'm collecting data all, all year. I know the year before where I'm probably going to kill. And so it's kind of that predictive modeling. It sounds crazy. How can you be this smart to figure these things out? It's not that I'm not, it's not that I'm smart. Animals are more, you can manipulate how they move through the landscape and you can generally predict where they're going to be based on certain preferences. Every deer is different. You need to evaluate what deer like to do in certain conditions. For example, if it gets really hot coming up, guess what? There's going to be more movement in the morning. Well, where's that movement movement going to likely be? Probably in cooler areas. So don't, you know, this is not overly complicated. Deer hunting shouldn't be this complicated. Right. Um, but you're looking at a lot of factors. So I did a lot of manipulation in there to get the deer working. And by the way, in that same area, I couldn't shoot a deer at 42 yards. So it doesn't, it didn't work perfect. I tried to pinch them down. They're going to do what they're going to do. And you can't, you can't make it like, okay, open the gate, here comes the deer. I mean, it's, you know, it's not that robotic. So, right. yeah, yeah, that's, hopefully that answers your question. But I usually have a plan going in prior to the season of how I'm going to kill a specific deer, um, assuming he lives or assuming he doesn't. A lot of deer kind of recycle and they take the, that other deer's place. I've seen that time and time again. Um, right now, I'm getting more deer coming into my property than I ever had. Um, and it's just, it's starting to open up the floodgates. I think they're starting to realize it's so awesome here that I need to be here. So, you know, I'm, I guess my job is to make it create awesomeness in the, in the deer yeah. world, right? So, you know, it's simple. simple. So is a lot of that food that you're putting in or is it a lot of it like TSI or, you know, how you're mostly setting things up? Mostly TSI. Um, the way I designed the bedding areas is, is different than I think I, I haven't seen anybody doing anything like I'm doing, I guess. 
Um, I'm putting food in there, but I actually like, for example, like in the center of my property, I have a food plot literally right in the center, in the bottom of two valleys. And so for the first couple of years, I create high value attraction. I want to create interest. And throughout the season, I'm creating interest or throughout the years, I'm creating interest. That food is, that food is going to deplete this year. This is the last year I'm going to do a food plot in the center of my property. The deer are getting it. I don't need to give them extra food to educate them or to create interest. Um, and I can't even hunt that area. And there's areas where I set up where I know I'm not going to be able to hunt. And I kind of create s s sanctuaries or safety zones. But I will hunt yeah. them if I have to. I've got tree stands set up in there. Um, but I'm very hesitant. I, my property is probably one of the hardest properties I've ever hunt. I have a complete north slope. Um, and, well, it's not completely, but a big portion of it is north slope. It's very hard to hunt. You know, basically you want to be a boy in a bubble hunting and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Scent just drifts all over the place. Well, that's you know? that's our problem is the freaking wind is just impossible on our property. I mean, everybody's like, hunt the wind, hunt this, hunt that. And it's like, you go sit in a tree stand no matter where you are on our property, and it is every which direction throughout your hunt. Yeah, it, you know, it's simple. Like, anybody designing their own property, like, you know, you get an area where a deer likes to be, and this deer was held up in an area where it's um, a couple ridges coming together where he was initially bedding. So when the wind shift, it didn't, it didn't benefit him. He had to change. He needed more cover in another area. It was too open in that area. So he was getting, um, it, it, was, it, was, it was a thermal hub slash wind pool, okay? And so he was getting the benefit of that in the morning. The wind was really slow. So break my hunt down a little bit more. The wind was really slow. He was likely to bend that area because he gets other benefits from the thermals. When that changed as the afternoon picked up and the wind started picking up, he had to change his location. So I killed that deer at 1030, right? Now, most guys would have been, man, it's 945, you know, early right. in the season. It's October. I'm going to get out of here. I'm like, man, I'm going to kill this deer around 930. I bet you. Right. Holy shit, he came in at 930 when the wind started changing. Yeah. And, you know, wind-based bedding and thermal-based, that's a big component of it. And you can break it down. When you go in there, study those areas to figure out how wind flows in certain – you can look at topography and start to evaluate just how thermals flow, you know. Uh, this is in a cooling cycle, so he's going to be a little bit lower down on the crest of the hill. Actually, there, he was probably in the bottom, and what he did is he came up top. So I was, I was trying to back trail the deer to figure out where he came from because uh, another bit of data, I checked my trail cameras after this. If I was going to go upset it, I actually drove up with my tractor. I used to drive up with a lawnmower and throw me yeah. back to Walmart because I mow all these trails through there. So I drove up with a tractor, put in the bucket, kept the tractor running, then checked all my trail cameras off the tractor, right? Next day, I'm loving it. We're going to get rain. I did not gut the deer in the woods because I want to preserve it. Um, and I scooped the deer up, slowly get out of there. If I could have wet up, you know, cleaned up the blood, I would have, you know, and, and, <laughs> and left, right? So I got the data I needed. I took that trail camera down and I put the story together. Okay, this, this relates. He came here about 940. He did this loop. He made this, you know, and, and uh, you know, so I was able to recreate the story. And if people can do that, you start to learn more about deer habits. And then you start to digest things a little bit more. And you, if, 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 again, I mean, it's, I love this stuff, man. It's a science experiment 90% of the time. Yeah. Sometimes it works out, you know. So. Yeah. And I feel like on our place, we have a harder time patterning them, per se. Um, yeah. I mean, we don't hold them at all over the summer. And it's funny because back before we really knew any of this stuff, we always be like, what the hell? We don't get any bucks on camera. But now that you're paying more attention and you're running more cameras, it's like clockwork. They start pinging and showing up. It's like, God, these deer are just like clockwork every year. We hold the doe group and then the buck group just flows in by October 10th. They start showing up and it's right. game on from there. Well, um, I've got a good friend. What you notice is a lot of the areas don't change, right? Crops are harvested around the same time. People's uh, approaches are about the same. Um, a lot of times you're getting less hunters in, in certain areas. So it starts to hurt you at some capacity because the pressure starts to go away right. from other areas. But, you know, when you, when I'm talking to a client, I say, well, what's all the camera data reveal? When are the interest in these areas? You know, what's the time frame of a lot of these things? And you start to get a good timeline of the story. And I'm like, okay, we're going to change everything about that. We're going to get deer in here way more often. And, and it's not that you want deer there all season long. You just, it's meaningless if you're not hunting, but you want to create interest all season long. You know, some degree of interest, even if they're there temporarily. And there's a ton of ways to do that. Um, I don't want to make this about habitat, you know, but it always boils down to it is I'm going to give some key advice. This year after the season, everyone that listens to this podcast, go out on your property and when winter gets very bad, start cutting trees. Give the deer immediate food. It starts to 
create that attraction factor that starts to drive their interest. You can change deer's core locations. There's been all these studies on where deer's core location, they think it's habitual. That habitual stuff changes in a moment. So you can, you can disrupt all that. Deer don't have to be in these other areas. They can be on your property. You can fix all that. A lot of times it's fixing the hunter, but you can create a lot of that. <laughs> you know, so, so everything that's going around you, it's clockwork because nothing changes, right? Yeah. So you guys got to just be the disruptor. You got to make the change. So, so it's interesting you. because, you know, I asked you about TSI um, and you said you do a lot of TSI and that's a lot of what, you know, when our deer season ends, my uncle, he has a firewood business and he picks an area each year to kind of do a clear cut and a thinning and kind of does that strategically to try to make it connect to the one he did the year before and make all these kind of travel corridors through the property. Um, and he's been doing that, you know, they've done firewood for 20 some years, but now that we're actually looking at it and thinking about it and getting more strategic about it, I would say the last six to eight years have been more of strategic cuts rather than just dropping good firewood trees. Yeah. Um, and man, has it showed cause, um, the first clear cut he did was at the base of our hill and that clear cut now is so thick that you can't even see the other side of it. You know, I mean, it's probably eight foot tall still, you know, even though yeah. everything's starting, starting to break down. Um, and I drove through there yesterday checking the trail camera before I left there. And I was actually looking for a spot to move a portable up along the base of that clear cut. And, uh, <laughs> there's a freaking doe and a little one standing in the end of the clear cut, like 10 yards away from our cutting link camera. And, uh, she just stood there. I mean, they were in the brush and I never stopped. I saw her. I just kept moving. I figured maybe there's a buck there or two around her. So I didn't yeah. want to stir anything up. So I just kept driving. They stood right there never moved. Um, but I mean that that's a clear cut that it's been there for six, eight years now. And the deer are just sucked right to it. It's unreal. Yeah. The, the biggest thing in being successful in designing hunting properties is, is really having a plan and, and emphasizing the right times to hunt uh, and execute, you know, it's great to be unconventional. I, I'm literally the most, I'm probably the most unconventional person you ever want to meet. Um, the things I do are different. I want to be different. Um, I think that that creates originality and it gets people beyond. Everybody listens to Jeff Sturges, any of these guys, a lot of it's, uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Uh, a lot of it's just rhetoric. A lot of it's propaganda. A lot of it's baloney. Um, you know, I want substance. It doesn't always have to be science-based. Some of the things in only are, are very valuable. And, and I, I would never dismiss that whatsoever. But, you know, real strategy. Um, I think hopefully I talked to Billy the other day about maybe doing something cool next year with maybe a public hunting challenge. And uh, I like, I, I, I'd like to see guys um, get outside their comfort zone because everyone's used to this pre-planned execution, right? Mm -hmm. let's, let's take, let's disadvantage everybody. Let's take a new area. Let's see how sharp these guys are. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'll suffer in that scenario. I'm not, you know, I'm getting away from freestyle hunting. I'm not going to just do this, right. you know, walk in the woods. I'm, I'm analyzing. You got to be very tactful. Most, it's a different style than the style that I'm doing, but that's a time thing. And I think a lot of people that don't have time, most of my clients are in that 50. Uh, well, I've got some clients in their forties, but a lot of them are in that 50, 50 to 60 age class. And it's funny because they want to be super productive but they have the most time, right? Yeah, they're so, all starting to retire, have vacation time. Exactly. They've got extra yeah. money and the school's income. And, and it's a lot of my client base. And it's funny because, um, you know, you, you've got to start to temper them and get them more control. And um, I think a lot of us that are even younger, they're very tactful, are trying to be extremely controlled. And it takes the fun out of it. So like all the stuff that you're saying, you know, don't shoot two and a half. I don't know. Like, I just say it to anybody, just have fun. I, I make this way too serious at times. Um, probably because it's a business, right? I want, right. I want people to gain something from the relationship with me. Uh, they're paying me obviously. So I want to get something out of the same point, you know, listen, I'm in Syracuse, New York. My deer population is minuscule. Okay. I'm killing big bucks every year. Now I, I don't think that's, I th that's not by happen happenstance. That, that is planned out. That's strategic. Um, and I am nothing special. I just break things down at a finer level and I'm able to execute and clearly not all the time because I missed. So, <laughs> you know, you know, That'll happen. I mean, that, that, that's, that's the big thing and picking the right days and going with clients to pick the right days. That's a big thing. Um, six hunts again, I, I'm not, I'm just telling you six hunts out of those six hunts. I've almost, 
I, I, I could have killed a target deer. It just got a little too late. I was not comfortable making that shot at 25 yards. And I would have killed, I would have been done during the October lull. And, and we wouldn't even be talking about Spidey. We'd be talking about a different buck that I killed. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm happy I could share that I dropped that bow out of the tree. So, you know, <laughs> I don't want to talk anymore. Let's hear about your hunt, man. You, you want to know what was funny is I was hunting a farm that I haven't hunted in two, three years. And my portable is like 25, 30 foot up in a maple tree. And you use limbs pretty much to get the entire way up. Oh, yeah, and that's safe. <laughs> I, I get there the other morning at like six. I got in there super early because I figured the stand was going to have to be reset. Sure. Um, I'm like, damn, I don't even know if there's a bow rope. And if there's not, it sucks because I climb around the tree all the way up. So the bow rope would be wrapped all the way around the tree. I'd have to like <laughs> climb up, hook it up, and then come back down and hook everything back up. And I'm like, I really hope that string's still there. And it was, but I could tell it was in pretty rough shape, but I gave it a good pull before I hooked the bow on. And I'm like, well, it didn't snap there. So that's got to be about as much as the bow weighs. <laughs> so I hung the bow on and then I climbed the tree with my pack on and everything. And I get all the way up there and sure as shit, the freaking strap was grown like an inch into the tree. So I had two ratchet straps. My took my pack off, hung it on a hook. I got the, I actually had a seatbelt cutter that I started carrying with me um for some of these tree stands so it's just a little ring i got it here yep. Yep. um it's a little ring oh, with cool. like a, a little pack on it yeah so i just throw that in my pocket because i've had this you know where i go move stands and all the straps are too tight and you can't get them off the tree next thing you know you got fucking trees all over your property with straps still on them because you couldn't get them off the tree <laughs> so <laughs> i started carrying that thing but i was in there like six fifteen, cutting the strap putting new straps on it and then i get up in the stand get my safety harness all hooked in and everything and i'm standing there and i'm like all right i gotta try to pull this bow up and as i'm pulling it i can like see the string is like unraveling from the, the rest of the string and i'm like jesus christ and it's pitch dark out so i can't even see and i finally got the bow up and i'm like you know that really would have sucked if i <laughs> freaking that got the bow at like 20 feet and the fucking string snapped and the thing went bouncing down through the limbs <laughs> yeah i've seen that happen <laughs> yeah so um, i mean i got lucky but you know that was one wait, of those deals i, gotta, I got i gotta ask you i gotta ask you a question your uh your straps that you you know you pack because you're planning all this out which sounds pretty funny um were they harbor freight specials or did you go big did you, did you go to AutoZone and get the, the slightly better straps i think it was an amazon order actually oh right, i think it was like the four pack camo ratchet straps off of amazon with like the yeah, 1200 pound getting, weight rating yeah. You're just gambling with the Chinese quality. That's fine. Yeah. No, it's fine. That's why you use two instead of one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I've been um, there, man. I have been there. I've yeah. done the exact same thing. So So that was a fun hunt on that old farm. By the time the sun came up, there was a really nice buck and doe bedded out in the field that I had just walked through on the way in forty five minutes before that. So I must have cool. been quiet enough in the tree doing all that stuff, getting that stand reset and climbing up in there. Um that all the deer were still out in the field by the time the sun came up so yeah um, you know funny pe people think like the you know you're you're banging on crap you, you make I, right i've gotten away with a lot of stuff man. oh yeah it's crazy oh this is funny i'm hunting the other night and uh, i bring coyote callers with me if i'm i have my big box flying up my field and it's all you know i can sneak in and out but you know i want to spook them so this is uh i've hunted that twice i brought my son once you know he's making all sorts of racket up there we seeing deer all i'm like shut up man you know we got it and uh so uh the second time i went in i didn't bring him with me and uh, i literally have deer bed down in the there's a switchgrass area that i have sub and deer bed in the switchgrass i can just see their heads it's dark and i'm like i gotta get out of here i was gonna kill me i gotta get home so uh i bring the coyote collar i i uh i usually put it up in a tree but what happened last time i did it um a buck came up and started smelling the coyote it came in from a totally different direction like these deer are unpredictable yeah. what the hell you know so uh i kind of startled him a little bit and he still came in which you know that was a mature buck by the way um so clearly coyote colors work um for attracting deer but this <laughs> this is interesting the coyote color i put it out i put it out the blind right i don't normally hunt out of box blinds guys this is new this is the first that's why i missed this anyhow um, I'm getting used to the box blind thing. It's, it works well with the wind though. So I pulled a, put it out the window. I got on a rope and I hit the button and coyote call goes off. The deer laid down. Okay. They, <laughs> they, they, they lay down. They're like comforted by this. And I'm like, man, I got to huh. turn the volume up, turn the volume up, hit it again. They lay down. I'm like, 
this is not work. This is always works. This is my thing. This is how I get out of here. So right. I gotta call my wife. My wife's like pissed, right? She's like pissed. She's like, what? I'm like, we gotta do my daughter's bath. Like, you know, she, you know, she goes, Are you have you killed yet? You know, she comes over, she bounces the beer off the car. I said, drive the car, I'll bounce them off. I gotta get out of here, I gotta keep this clean. Um, and so anyhow, I'm thinking to myself, man, you know, you can make all this racket noise and this and that. It's just, you know, yeah, I don't know. It's it's interesting. Yeah, that's where it does get a little crazy because you know that that farm is very unique because there's like a eight acre hay field out front, eight acres of woods, and like an eight acre brush lot out back. Yeah. Um, and it's very narrow. Uh, so I've been hunting that since I was a little guy, and every single year there's a goddamn doe there that knows when your truck's parked out there that you're somewhere along the front edge of the woods. And that son of a bitch, when the sun came up, she stood up out of her bed and she started marching right down to the freaking end of the field there to try to find me. And uh, they did this one year and one of them got themselves killed trying to find me because now that I'm 25, 30 foot up in this maple tree and all these limbs, they can't freaking find me to save their life, but they're going to try every time. Um, So she actually had my wind a little. If she didn't have my wind, I know damn well she'd have came to the edge of the woods looking for me. And I would have, I would have whacked her, but there's like, we used to hunt ladder stands on the edge of the, on the edge of the field and the field drops down in the back and there's a ridge like 50, 60 yards out coming across it. So they stand on the ridge. So they're level with you at at your platform or your ladder stand. And they'll just stand there and scan the woods and they'll just wait till they pick you out or, or they see you move or whatever. So now that I'm higher up in that tree in a portable, they can't find me. So they get pissed off and come down and try to find me. <laughs> and it normally I'm gonna rec- I'm gonna recommend a tactic for everybody. So when you have a situation like that, bring a paintball gun with you. Mark that <laughs> doll if you can, depending on the distance you get with a paintball gun, and make sure she dies as soon as yeah. possible. <laughs> yeah. No, I was telling my dad's buddy, the one that I got in there with, I was telling him, I was like, man, if she had given me 14 more yards, I pinned her at 44. And it was pretty it was pretty dark yet. Um yeah. But if she'd have kept coming, if she had got to 30, I'd have let her have it. Because once that doe, once you have one of them does, it does that. She ain't going to stop until she figures it out or dies, one or the other. Yeah. That's why every stand you pick, you got to have, you know, around it some other options in case right. you, know, you do get, you get, you get, you get doinked up there in this tree stand. I, you know. Oh, yeah. man. Tell me about your buck, man. I'm, I was talking so much about my pontificating <laughs> baloney. What, yeah. Tell me about so, this kill, man. I'm not sure what the exact date was, but I, I got the spy point camera on us. Uh, it's like a community scrape that has been the last few years. Sure. Um, but this year doesn't seem to be taken off as good. But the one down in the food plot that you helped me with, um, that food plot's got an apple tree in the end of it. And there wasn't that many apples this year, but there was like a freaking six by six community scrape under that thing started in like, the 12th of October. Um, okay. so at first we were like, ah, it's just a little buck screwing around messing with it. But then we put a camera on it and it's like every goddamn buck that comes to our property is hitting that scrape. And that used to be what it was and what we call the middle meadow, which is where I tried that corn plot this year. Mm-hmm. Um, and my uncle actually being up there every weekend doing firewood and TSI stuff. Um, he kept an eye on that corn plot cause he was like, you're fucking retarded for planting corn in there. He's like, that ain't never going to work. And I'm like, I'm telling you what, I'm like, I'm trying it. I don't care if it's just cover or what. I'm like, I'm going to give it a whirl this year. We got bags of corn sitting here. I'm going to see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, I put it in and it was pretty dry, um, after I planted it, but it did start coming up. Um, and I think it might've been like three, four weeks before I got down there again. And I got down there and it was coming up pretty good. And I'm like, holy crap, this is really taking off. Um, but he said he was there every weekend doing firewood. And he was like, every every weekend when I was there, I made sure to drive up and check on that because I just didn't believe you that it was going to work. And he was like, I didn't think it was going to come up out of the ground. And he goes, son of a bitch, it came up out of the ground. And then he was like, a few weeks later, he was like, that stuff's never going to get over three foot tall. And then he's like, next thing I know, it was four or five foot tall. Then he was like, that ain't never going to tassel out. He's like, the next weekend I come up, it was tasseled out. <laughs> then he was like, he goes, then the thing that sucks is he goes, the following weekend, he was like, it ain't never going to ear out. He goes, you started growing ears. And he goes, I don't know what the hell it was that got in there, but he was like, as soon as that stuff started growing ears, they mauled it. 
he was like it never stood a chance he was like if he goes it did grow he goes you surprised me it grew but um he was like i'm not he he goes if we could have put a fence around that or something he was like it would have came in perfect because it was it was growing quick did you do it was it a was it a did you till and 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 spread i forgot for what did you do with uh i tilled twice because we didn't spray for weeds or nothing okay yeah so i tilled twice two different directions and then i just took the corn seed up there and broadcasted it and then i took a log chain on a two by six and rolled it all over um so that was all i did with that plot and then the other one was right around when we were having our kid um and i was talking to you i'm like i ain't got shit for time but i want to get something in the ground up there so you gave me some recommendation i you know i was like i don't want to spray i don't want to take the time to spray I don't want to fertilize. We've fertilized in the past. We've limed in the past. I'm like, it's just throwing money into the ground and it's not giving us any results. Sure. So I believe you gave me, I think it was oats, rye, and um, clover, red clover. Mm-hmm. I think it was. Yep. Uh, yeah, you gave yeah me I, that, think, I think that was a combo. Yeah. You gave me that Simple. mix. So I stopped at the Agway on the way down there and bought that mix. And I did the same thing with that food plot. I tilled two directions and I actually found a corrugated pipe that was the same length as the two by six for the log chain yeah. I, I took the log chain off on one end slid that corrugated pipe on um and i actually rolled it in instead of just completely dragging it in oh that's um, that's yeah probably spread it out even it looked beautiful yeah. in the pictures i saw it's yeah, perfect so. perfect height and i gave you a plan b as well so as we <laughs> you could have yeah. lost man you, right you know hey that's so that's a uh, that's good advice i guess yeah <laughs> so so the worst thing that happened is i couldn't you had told me you're like if you can get down there and mow it when it's six eight inches and throw some white clover in there you'll have a beautiful plot in the spring absolutely yeah. um and i just couldn't make it happen this year so no um, you know go down and put some white in there you know when you get a chance i mean yeah there's no reason you can't you can't put some in and right you know, people put a lot of value in, in food plots and you know to some degree they're helpful and clearly yeah. it probably didn't hurt you but you know they don't have to be perfect right you should see my food plots man they're, they're <laughs> so great. I mean, after that, um, when that came up, the deer just started crushing it. Um, and I honestly didn't even have to mow it because of how much they're feeding on it. But um, that seemed to be the hub of the activity after we got that one going. Yep. So, yep. I mean, there's scrapes all around my corn plot, but there's not really any food there for them now. Um, yeah. So it really seems like it moved down. And the other thing is, is that TSI that my uncle's been doing kind of hooks more into that other one the cabin plot that we call it um then it does my middle meadow my middle meadow is pretty open woods all the way around it yeah there's there's yeah. pockets of brush that come into it so i think that's why i do get a lot of crossing through there um because he has done tsis on each side of it so it's like they do pop out go through it pop into the next one um but as far as food i didn't really hit it great with food this year so um it seems like the majority of the does are concentrated down on the cabin plot where that other mixes that I put in um so we had this goofy buck start showing up on trail camera somewhere around the 10th 12th and I really was looking at him thinking he ain't that great of a buck kind of weird you know he must have bent that horn during velvet yeah, um, yeah I'm like yeah I don't know if I'd shoot that one and then we got a picture of him I think on like the 18th or the 20th and uh he was standing right in front of the cutty link and he was just beastly looking and I'm like that might be a problem if that walks in front of me. <laughs> so I had this week off. Um, it's my wife's last week on leave. Yep. So I was trying to find a balance. Obviously she's like, what do you want to hunt? And obviously I'm sitting here like, I'd like to hunt the entire week. Um, but so I was trying to find a balance. I hunted camp last weekend on the tail end of that front. Cause I thought that would really kick off up there. The cameras had died down. Sure. Um, and then I figured at the front, they'd kick back up. So got down there uh saturday hunted saturday all day and then half day sunday um and did not see much of anything i saw like maybe six deer all weekend um so i was like you know what we'll take monday off um tuesday i hunted that farm that i grew up on hunting um and then i was either gonna hunt wednesday thursday and then hunt friday saturday and it was funny because i was looking at that jury deer cast and it showed the middle of the week being garbage, like the worst hunting of the week. And I was looking at my trail camera, my cell cam, and I had nothing from like Tuesday night into Wednesday morning at like 
five, five thirty when I got up to take care of the baby. And my wife was like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I think I got to go this morning. I'm like, I didn't have any activity. And all of a sudden I'm starting to have bucks on scrapes, you know, an hour before daylight. So I got down there. I got down there a little bit late, but I drove right up to the cabin, which is 80 yards, hundred yards downhill from that uh, cabin plot. So I drove right up to the cabin, parked my truck, threw my jacket and my pack on, hiked up the hill, um, walked right across that plot, uh, walked up the four wheeler trail and hopped up in my tree stand. And I'm in like the split of two trails. One runs the base of the hill. The other one runs right down into that cabin plot. And, uh, I have a camera on that road and it showed me morning activity of bucks just cruising the road. Um, so I got a 10 yard broadside shot to that road and, I'm, I sit down in the stand at like 7.35. I'm like, I'm going to sit down and relax for a little bit. Yep. And uh, something happened. I don't know. The stand kind of popped, made a noise. And I'm like, ah, shit. So I'm like sitting there. I'm like, I got to be quiet. So I decided to shift my weight after like five minutes and I did it again. And I'm like, God damn it. I'm not going to be able to sit all day. I'm like, I can't keep sitting and having this thing popping around on me. So um, I heard a branch snap behind me. And I'm like, that really sounded like a deer. And I'm like looking over my shoulder <laughs> and it was a doe. She was in between the logging road and the food plot. And she came in, she had her head up looking, she heard it. Um, so she ended up coming to the four wheeler trail that I walked in on. And as soon as she hit it, she smelled my boot tracks walking in and bounded away. And I'm like, son of a bitch. I'm like, you know, it's wet out and wearing rubber boots. It should be fine. Um, and then a second deer was coming behind her. And I'm like, oh, it's got to be a buck. And it was. It was a little six point. And yep. he didn't know what she bounded away for. So he freaking started rubbing a tree and grunting. And then he just walked off. I don't really know. It's so thick behind me. I don't really know where he went. But um, sitting there at like 8.15, 8.30, I'm like, all right, I'll throw out a grunt call. I'm right at the base of this hill. We had pictures of, you know, we have pictures of all these bucks up the hill and above that clear cut at the base of the hill, you know, all the bedding and does. And there was bucks down there. Saturday when I was down there last weekend there was a buck that came down the north end of that clear cut right above my corn plot but I don't know if the wind was drifting up the hill and he turned and walked back up the hill but it was a nice 10 point he was coming right down the hill to me um but I think the wind drifted and he he turned and went back up the hill so I was like this seems to be the happy hour between eight and nine I'm like I gotta try to throw out a grunt see what happens I normally don't blind call you know if I see yeah. one and it's too far out I'm gonna call to it a little see if I can get it to turn and come in yep. um but I was like you know what this just it's a foggy morning just looks like a great morning to just screw with them so I threw out a few grunts and uh I'm just standing there watching around watching towards the north end of the clear cut there um and I hear or I didn't hear I saw a deer moving across the side hill and as soon as I saw him, I was like, shit, that's a big deer. And then he popped out into the hardwoods and I'm like, holy shit, that's that buck with that bent horn um, or the bent beam. Yep. And then I realized that he was on a damn mission because I had just grunted, you know, it didn't even click till he was like really marching at me. I'm like, holy shit, he's coming to that grunt call. And he is just <laughs> yeah. marching through that freaking woods. And I'm like, holy shit. So I get my bow and get clipped on and, uh, he was heading, he was on the upper logging road heading right in front of me. And I'm like, this is perfect. 10 yards broadside. He'll be done. Um, and he stopped right before my camera on the logging road and he turned and he walked in between the two logging roads where it's thick. And, uh, I drew back. There was a freaking limb right in the way when he stopped at 25 broadside. Um, and of course, what does he do? He turns and just walks directly at the base of my tree. So now I'm full draw and he's just walking straight at me. So I waited. He kind of turned downhill a little bit, hit that next logging road that runs down into the food plot. So he walks, he's literally like under my platform and he's almost to where that doe busted. And he stopped and I'm like, I know this is a horrible shot. I know so many people wound deer with a shot, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but I was like, aim low. I'm like, everybody aims dead on and they miss high spine them, you know, shoot over them, whatever. So I'm like, just telling myself, aim low. And he's perfect little quartering broadside right under me. And I aim low and it's a damn good thing. I aim low because if I would aimed on, I'd have shot right over him. But yeah, I aim low and I spined him. I actually drilled him yep. right in the left side of the spine and uh, he dropped and started rolling and flipping. And I'm like, son of a bitch. 
I'm like, you know, I've done that before, you know, not <laughs> dead on below me, but like yeah. out in front of me, I've shot high and had them drop into the arrow. Um, and the one time that happened, it turned into a freaking wild goose chase. I shot all my arrows. My brother had to chase him down, shoot his arrows at him. Um, we finally got him, but I'm like, Jesus, I've seen this before. So I go running down there. I freaking lowered my bow, go running down the climbing sticks. Uh, right before I hit the ground, I got to stop to unclip my bow because my bow string's too short on that stand. So <laughs> I kind of stop and listen for a second. And I'm like, I'm not hearing anything anymore. I'm like, he was making a hell of a racket and he ain't, I'm not hearing nothing now. So I'm like watching down to where he went towards the food plot and nothing's moving, nothing's going on. So I just unclipped the bow, got down, knocked an arrow and started sneaking down there real slow. I could see him laying there and I'm like, with how quiet it is, you know, with the leaves and stuff, even if he is alive, I could sneak right into like 10 yards and freaking draw back and whack him again. So I get down there and I'm like, his head's like upside down. I'm like, he's like all twisted around, like he's either got himself stuck under a log and he can't get up or he's dead. So I walked up to 10 yards and stood there for like 15 minutes. And I'm like, he's dead. He ain't moving. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I got luck. I got lucky with that shock. I know it's a tough Yeah. Shock. You hit the arteries. In the, in the, yeah. Well, no, I actually, I might've clipped the artery artery along the spine, but we gutted him out. We same thing. You said we didn't gut him there. We got a few pictures and took him down the hill past the cabin and gut him out down in the woods down there where we don't hunt. Um, so when we were gutting them out, um, that arrow freaking blasted right through the left side of the spine and actually drove down into the top or not the top, the left lung, it blew right through the left lung down into the lung and he snapped the arrow off. And when he was flipping around that broadhead and that end of that shaft were in there, just tearing it up. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. he was dead in under a minute. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a great story. Yeah. I got a too. Hell. I mean, I, I wonder how old that deer is. I mean, it's just gnarly mass and just see. I always kind of, I always try to judge mostly off of like body size and stuff, but I feel like that one's older than what the body size leads on to. I don't know. Well, you know, I, it's hard to do that, right? I I killed the buck last year that dressed two o two, right? Um, and he was a three and a half year old. The buck that I killed really? this year, I haven't aged him yet. He might be a four and a half. I think he's a three and a half as well, but. I mean, he's if he is a three and a half comp. I mean, he dressed at one sixty two. So there's a there's a fifty pound difference or forty pound difference between those two deer. That's a yeah. that's a you, you know every every everybody's designed differently. You know, so I think he's an old. It looks like an older deer to me. I, you it know, just seems I like most it. the old old deer that we shoot up there are you know one eighty to two hundred. Yeah. And we didn't put them on a scale yet, but I was thinking like one fifties. Yeah. weight wise i don't know but rip that jaw bone out you know it's not as, it's probably not as accurate for an older deer but i'd be interested to see you know what, i mean will a taxidermist do a tooth or anything um i mean you can you can send it away to like a, a, a there's a lab um there's a lab out in montana that that, that that does the incisor test right they look at the, the scaling of the teeth that that's one option um i mean i do tooth wear on all my deer because i don't for some reason i'm like cheap don't want to send stuff out i should yeah um you know, I'm, I'm, I think I'm a scientist, so I can figure it out, right? So I just, I look at the tooth wear. Do you count, see, do you count the rings on at. the teeth? Uh, you just uh, dental enamel, that's kind of what you look <laughs> at the, the wear. So your deer down there probably eat rocks, because when I used to hunt in Allegheny County, uh, they were eating rocks up in the fields. So the oh, tooth yeah. wear is a lot different, so it's regionally specific, right? So you got to have history with teeth to kind of like get some, you know, some genuine understanding. And, you know, it's, right. you can't. I'm looking at a guy's teeth last night from South Carolina, right? The guys from South Carolina don't hunt South Carolina. And we're doing compares against other deer, right, as kind of a fact check. Their diets change. They change annually. But I keep saying, you know, a lot of things are the same in the deer woods. You know, unless you got a bigger, right. a big rock crop this year, uh, you know, you should, be, uh, <laughs> you should be all right. I mean, I'm used to – I mean, they, actually, they got luscious food this year. So all those deer won't have as much uh, enamel decay. So Right. You know. But, yeah, yeah, no, yeah it was... rip, rip the tooth out, send it – or. Take some pictures and we'll kind of look at the teeth and go through that. It's, a, it's one option. It's yeah, I'll have, to, I'll have to do something because we've always talked about age of deer and you really don't know until you figure out scientifically what the age is, of them is, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, you know, hey, why not? And start keeping data, right? The data log I mean, stuff that, is... that could be a freaking six-year-old deer that's on the way out, you know. Who the hell knows? Yeah, and I heard I heard it's I wasn't working too well. So you, I heard it might have been blind. Maybe it gave you a little advantage up there. I think he was maybe one eye blind, but 
<laughs> I'm telling you what, if you look at that tree stand in that tree, ain't nothing picking me out of there. Like, yeah, my, my stands are no fun to get into, but they're normally very strategically placed to where like, <laughs> if you drive by the tree and unless you saw the climbing sticks, you wouldn't know the damn stands there. That's cool. That's cool. It sounds like you bring ranch straps with you everywhere though. It's just safety. Only on the old ones. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so last year I actually went around for like the first year in like four years and loosened all my stands and sticks <laughs> <laughs> so th- this this year i had to go back around and like reset everything which i'm not, not well, used to but i've been lately the guy this year what i did i, I like i've been liking ladder stands and got some i like kind of being low now in the trees and uh although you know i used to skyrocket and i'm like yeah well oh, throw another you know throw another strap around i'll be all right <laughs> yeah. i mean i don't know <laughs> well it's tough bar- because like when you, yeah when you set them you know it's like sometimes things are a little loose it's like you give them a year and then everything's nice and snug so you don't want to mess with it. Yeah, there so, you go. That's that's a great I'm normally <laughs> on like the three to four year rotation when the straps start to get real, real tight. We should probably loosen them up, but yeah, look, you get that nice a, one done. We should do a safety disclaimer part of this podcast so nobody does anything <laughs> that you just said. <laughs> if you're all nodding your heads, yes, then we're all the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, I'm sure there's a lot of you guys out there. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm my, not my habitat plans and hunting plans that I do, I prescribe exactly against what Jimmy said. Don't listen to him at all. So <laughs> if you're going to hire me, expect that. So when you're screwing up, I'm going to give you a little sermon on, on, on that and safety, right? So, I, could, I could write write you a whole memo of what not to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, if I could put that as an appendix to my plan, I'd appreciate that. Yeah, that'd be perfect. We can figure something out for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... I think I ought to get wrapping this up. I don't know what you got going on this afternoon, but I got some family things I got to attend to. So good. Yeah, no, I appreciate having me on. I'm happy everyone can listen to my trials and tribulations. And yeah, like, no, me too. I mean, story. it's it's funny because everybody that I talk to, you know, everybody's all jacked up about Frank. And I'm like, I, I know you guys are all excited about Frank, but I have no self-control and I have a real nice two and a half year old walk by me in the times, right? <laughs> it's going to happen. But yeah, I got... I think he, I, I got lucky this year, and I think I stepped uh, it up I don't in the age so. caliber a little bit. But yeah, I think you cast your chips in. I think that at this point you're gonna <laughs> have, now you're you you're only going up from here, man. Yeah, I mean what what's yeah. funny is and what you were talking about is being strategic. That's not something I normally am. Normally, I got my spots. I like to hunt. I know I can hunt every day. You know, it's just like yeah. I'm not strategic about it. You know, I got good spots. I know what I'm doing but I'm kind of lax about it because I just want to spend every day in the woods. And if it happens, it happens. But this year I knew it was going to be less time in the woods. And I actually thought about it more, you know, more cell cam stuff, you know, kind of, you know, I wouldn't have probably gone hunting Wednesday morning if I didn't have those cell cam picks fire up at five in the morning. Cause I was like, you know what? They didn't move for the last 18 hours. And all of a sudden I'm getting bucks hitting scrapes. I'm like, there might be something to that. I better get in the woods. And, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I always, I always think, I always go back to this one point. You know, we live in a pretty suppressed area weather-wise, right? When you have good weather, um, or or sm- a small section, a slice of good weather, and you got to take advantage of that. Um, I mean, I did just did a podcast and another thing, talk about hunting kind of rainy days and those those benefits too. And frankly, yeah. you know, you got to be even more strategic on those days. If you're not a hunt. But I think if you put the story together, you a lot of people can be more efficient. A lot of people that have time, they can hunt a lot. It's fun. I mean, come on, yeah. you love it. But I mean, at some point, you know, something's got to give. And either you want to be really successful or you just want to spend time in the woods. Um, I, got, I got a guy who was a client and, and tell him, I said, his thing to me was, I hunt every day. And I said, you do? <laughs> I said, that's wrong. He just messaged me recently. He said, I've been hunting a lot. And I said, please don't tell me every day. And he says, almost. And I said, clearly you're not listening right a lot of people don't want to listen and recognize that's a problem yeah do other stuff man listen go do yard work seriously find a hobby find another right. hobby other deer hunting deer, deer hunting season go, so be way more successful the other part of that is is you know don't hunt the same spot or the same property every time because right. you know as i say i hunted you know every day last year and didn't have to worry about it too much I also hunted a different property almost every day, you know, Absolutely. I mean, have options. Yeah. yeah. I'm all over the place. I'm not overdoing one spot. Yeah. And, the, and I've gotten the, to this point now too, where normally my first sit in a stand, I could kill a deer. Yeah. And it used to be like, I'd hunt the hell out of that stand and then I wouldn't see anything the rest of the season out of it. 
Yeah, and it, you know, a lot of times it's not it's not as much the stand, right? It's the ingress egress. It's it's right. just the boots. And, and if anybody starts really, I mean, I got a routine with boots that I tell my clients. You know, it's it's a write up in my report, right? You get you get this entire report, and we go through boot maintenance. That's the first thing I talk about. It's the most important critical thing, and how I maintain my boots, my system, my process. That's the stuff that makes the difference between. Uh, God, I don't want to say it's winners and losers, but I mean that, that success and non-success, right? So, yeah. you know, I, you know, I think those are huge aspects of it, and, and I think a lot of people, if they put more time into the small things, um, I won't let friends hunt with me because they don't take care of their boots. You're not coming on my property if you don't do my boot routine, and and that's that's my partner. He's not allowed to hunt with me anymore until he figures out his boot situation. Until I see some progress, he's not on my he's not allowed on my range. So I show him every picture that I get. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, it's funny. But it's true, but actually. <laughs> it, it's funny, like, the hunting strategic, like, I've been hunting up north for years and never shot a deer. Yeah. Um, you know, this year I've been trying to be more strategic, and I killed my first doe up there, and I've killed my first buck over two and a half, you know, and we're not even at the end of October yet. So it's like, I, I can kind of sit back and relax and enjoy the fact that I've already had a successful season. Well, one thing you one thing you shouldn't do at this point is you know kind of sit back and say you know right now what am I gonna do? I'm pushing the limits I'm going anywhere I can I'm learning anything I can it's a great time yeah. you know a great time to destroy woods spend a lot of time so when I say destroy put your boots all over it, figure things out um, I'm not saying areas where you're trying to preserve them for the next you know the next age class deer or whatever you're trying to do to keep right. them safe but get out there start start figuring start figuring stuff out that's what I'm doing I'm going to hunt areas I never hunt before. I got a plan to kill another buck during gun season. I never do this. I usually shoot a deer during bow season and I don't want to, I'm very conservative. I don't need to take another deer. I need to start shooting does. We're going to shoot does, but I kind of got this inkling about killing this, this other deer. And yeah. right now I'd say I got a 50, 50 chance killing. Them. So it depends on what happens in the next couple of weeks, but you know, yeah. I'm planning ahead, right? I mean, you got a whole, you got a whole. I mean, I've, of, I've also changed my philosophy the last couple of years. I used to want to like, I was just huge. on wanting to fill the buck tags. And I didn't really yeah. care what the bucks were. I just wanted yeah. to fill my buck tags. Yeah. But now that I'm a little bit older and changing a little bit, I'm like, I don't need to fill buck tags. If I want to put yeah. meat in the freezer, I'm going to just go to my buddy's farm, pound down does. I'm going to kill one to two does at camp a year. You know, I'm going to fill my freezer off of does. And um, if I don't get a buck, I don't get a buck. So um, yeah. It's funny because since I've taken on that theory, I've filled almost every buck tag still, but they're decent bucks. So, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, 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 a, that's, you know, that's a philosophy. I think a lot of people have at this point. Yeah. Uh, it works. It clearly works. So cool. All right. Well, good luck in the rest of your season here and definitely would love to hook up with you and get you down to our camp at some point. Yeah. To have you definitely. tell us how much stupid shit we're doing wrong, but probably not a lot. I don't want to make fun of anybody. <laughs> Uh, if anybody needs to get hold of me, my business is Whitetail Landscape. Uh, I got a website, uh, Instagram. I'm mostly on Instagram. I, I hate Facebook. Um, just want to throw that out there. Um, you can get a hold of me. Um, I have clients. I have clients all, all the way through March at this point. So I'm I'm getting booked, which is awesome. Yeah, it's um, perfect. And you know, I can only take on so many clients a year, um, and I'm getting more regular, recurring clients. So at some point, I won't be able to take on clients, which is which is great. That's a great option to have, but. Uh, I'm helping people um, and I spend a lot of time with the clients and uh, I think you get the most, my reports are about a hundred pages. You get a hundred pages of information, uh, 50 pages, around 50 pages just on your property. So 40, 50 pages in that range. Now I've kind of added some things to them on the last plan and I'm actually doing my last right next week. I have my last person. I've got uh, a couple months for me and, and, uh, but I'd love to come down and help you guys be a part of anything you guys are going on and next year. Just be pushing it. Public Land Challenge in New York. Yeah. And I'll be there kicking anybody's ass. No, I'm just trying to hunt and having a good time. So. Yeah. Drinking bush lights. <laughs> yeah. Drinking some bushes. So. <laughs> yeah. No, we'll have to try to do that. Um, and thanks for hopping on here and spending some time with me today. And congrats on your buck. And me too. Uh, me too. We'll have to see if we can hook up again here soon. Yeah, Jimmy. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Yep. Have a good one. You too.